So a couple of things. What is vision? Well, um, as a largely self-taught person in this, I, I, I navigate by the four great patron saints of management. Number one, um, you can observe a lot just by watching. That's the great Yogi Berra. <laughs> Number two, I skate to where I think the puck is going to be. That's the great Wayne Gretzky. Number three, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And the fellow who said that is Alan Kay. And in case you don't know who Alan Kay is, he's the man who invented Windows. It's not the man who got rich on Windows, but he's the man who invented Windows. And number four, from Mark Twain, tell the truth. It's easier to remember. <laughs> and in that vein, as you know, I, I'm logoreic. I publish lots of stuff, free for nothing, no salesman will call. And part of the reason that we do that is because I think that people who live in an ecosystem have an obligation to make it better. Fred alluded to my occasional forays into trying to explain to the government how to deal with this complex critter. You all know how difficult and complicated this business is. Tina talked about the, the acronyms and the alphabet soup. There is a massive amount of complexity in this business. And that complexity, I will submit to you, is intrinsic to it. But the people who create the rules and the money without which the business would not exist do not have the time to internalize the complexity. They need people like us and like NHNRA to explicate it in ways that are reliable and testable and verifiable. And so I want to remind you of three truisms about this business that we all know, but judging from Fred's trip to Capitol Hill, not everybody knows. Number one, affordable housing is good public policy. You can sell this to liberals, you can sell this to conservatives, you can sell this at the national and the state and the local level. Affordable housing, and in particular, our special area affordable rental, is good public policy. You don't have to apologize for it in any office you walk into. You may shift the arguments, but you don't apologize for it. Number two, affordable housing always costs money, and at scale, it costs money from government. There is no free lunch. When Lisa talks about, I think it was 37 million people living below the poverty line, we are not going to solve that problem with low interest rates and secondary mortgage markets because the price of housing rises, because the price of land rises. And that's the third point, and the reason you're all in this room. Affordable housing finance is hard. Even in an environment that was more benign than the one we've got, even in a different regulatory environment, this stuff is hard, okay? And those are three principles. And what that means is if you're dealing with people in government, you have to tell them how the ecosystem actually works. You have to give them good and accurate and honest information. They want to make better laws. If you don't help them understand what is a better law or a better program, then shame on you, shame on us, because they will screw it up. Not out of mal, 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 mal intent, but because they don't know how to do it. So. A month ago, I was the keynote speaker at something called the San Diego Housing Federation, and they asked me for a summary of my talk. And I sent it out to them. And they sent an email back and said, is this really what you're going to talk about? <laughs> and I said, yes. And the reason, the reason they, and I think they went scrambling for the dictionary, is because the nature of my talk was Cretaceous Extinction versus Cambrian Explosion. <laughs> Now, for those of you who don't have a nine-year-old boy at home, Cretaceous extinction is how the dinosaurs died. 65 million years ago, all the dinosaurs died. We don't quite know why, but they all died all at once. And the Cambrian explosion, which occurs even further back in paleontology, um, was a period of time when a vast number of new species got created. It's when life first kicked off in this planet. And Lisa alluded to the formation of things in tough times. I had the good fortune to have every single hinge event in my business career occur in the middle of a recession in the crapper. I started in this business in 1975. I went to work for a company, not the one listed in your program, there's a small typographical error, I, at, at a time when they had shrunk their company staff by half. So they had begun the year before with 60 people and ended it with 29. I started my own company in 1989, which for those of you who remember in Massachusetts was not the best year to be starting a real estate company. Um, and you're giving me this award in 2009, which is a measure of how desperate you are that the situation is bad. <laughs> 
But what Schumpeter proved is that what, what he calls creative destruction is the strength of capitalism. Recessions clear away the deadwood. Recessions create not just cyclical change, but structural change. And we are going through structural change here. And the thing that will take you out of the recession is to recognize the intrinsic value proposition of attempting to reinvent this stuff, in, to invent a more efficient delivery. I have tremendous admiration for people like Lisa. But when I hear her say, 10 years to do St. Adams, I mean, my head is pointy enough from banging against the federal government. The idea that I would be banging against the, the, the city council in Brookline or something for 10 years, there would be nothing left inside after I got done banging at that. So you have, so the thing you need to do, in desperate times, people will do things that they wouldn't do before. You have to think about the new space, okay? And what I, I have become the unlikeliest champion of the light tech, and I'm very close to finishing up, because this is the, going to be the positive part. I'm the unlikeliest champion of the low-income housing tax credit there is, because we're not a syndicator, we're not an investor, we're not an allocator, okay? And yet, allocators and investors are symbiotic. Allocators are exquisitely sensitive to the public purpose side, and they are less sensitive to risk, because it's their job to allocate the scarce resource and deliver the social outcome. Investors are exquisitely sensitive to the risk side, and less sensitive, one might even say indifferent, to the social side. And it turns out that they can be indifferent to the social side because the social side is captured in QAP. And, and the investors can, uh, sorry, the, the allocators can be indifferent, sorry, let's do this right, I don't want to screw it up. Investors can be indifferent to the social side because it is captured in the QAP. Allocators can be less concerned about the risk side because if the deal is not viable, it doesn't get the money. Between the two of them, you cover the dual mission which is at the heart of everything we do. This the, the, the private sector can produce affordable housing really easily. We did it for thousands of years. Simple, reduce maintenance, Pick a crappy location, reduce maintenance, put a lot of very poor people together, close the top, simmer, it's called a slum. That's economically successful, it's economically rational, it is a social failure, it's not acceptable. We can go the other way, we can produce perfectly social housing, it's, cost, it's called $300,000 a unit, we can't afford that either. We have to do both, that's the symbiosis. That to me is the thing that makes the LIHTC, the Low Income Housing Tax Credit, such a remarkable thing and that got created out of serendipity. And therefore, it's worth protecting. And if I have done, if I have had a message for the last 12 months, it's that our delivery system is in jeopardy, that the loss of investor demand threatens the fundamental viability of the system. And if the system goes down, I'm not so worried about us as individuals, you know, we'd be back in two years with different name badges, we're doing some other different thing, but I'm very concerned about the quality of the inventory. The system is worth preserving because it puts people in roles that are logical and comfortable for them and that are symbiotic with intrinsic roles of other people. And if we can clean away and reduce the clutter, and that's what recessions are good for, is clearing away those things that used to be luxuries, that, that we came to accept as necessities but are really luxuries. So I will leave you with the following, two, two more ideas. First idea, if you do not know what you want, you can be darn sure you will not get it. You can't always get what you want, but if you do not know what you want, I can guarantee you, you won't get it. And the second one was, they taught it to you in driving school, if you go into a skid, turn in the direction of the skid. And so my message to you is our industry is in a skid. It is up to us and you to take leadership in turning it back into the direction of reviving the demand and putting the, the value chain and the ecosystem back together. And to the extent that I help you all do that, I guess that's what they call vision, and I'm really grateful and gratified to be given this award and to see all of you here. So thank you very much.